Want to know where every European country got its name? OK then, it's time for another Rob Words. I've uncovered all kinds of bits and bobs while researching this that I think you're really going to like. I haven't seen other people talking about these either. We've got a whole continent to get through. Let's get cracking. So where should I start? Yeah, well, right here, I suppose. I'm speaking to you from Germany, so-called, because to the Romans it was the land of the Germani, their name for the weird people speaking gibberish languages to the east of the River Rhine. The historian Tacitus used the word for his work about the poor folk living outside of the Roman Empire. The Romans also used the word Alemanni to describe a confederation of Germanic people, and that's where a load of other languages get their word for Germany too. Meanwhile, the Slavs to the east of Germany shared the Romans' bafflement about the Germanic languages and dubbed their neighbours' homeland the Land of the Mutes. Germany is unusual in the number of different names it's been designated across Europe, and the Germans themselves don't agree with any of them, and certainly not with the Estonians and Finns who call all of Germany Saxony. But that's just a bit of Germany. The Germans call their own country Deutschland, which means Land of the Dutch, confusingly. Dutch comes from a very old Germanic word meaning popular or people, so Deutschland means land of the people. Classic German creativity on display there. Okay, that's a little unfair. In Germany, Deutsch actually firstly referred to people speaking what to them were the popular languages, the languages they understood. So Deutschland is actually better rendered as land of the German speaker. Which leads us nicely on to where we think the Dutch live, the Netherlands. Netherlands just means low countries. It's an enduring reference to the country's lowness versus sea level and its general flatness. In the past, the term Netherlands applied to a larger area than the modern day country, but the term is nevertheless preferable to what for a long time was seen in English as an alternative name, Holland, which actually refers to a smaller area. Holland comes from the Dutch for woodland, by the way. So why do we call the people who live in the Netherlands the Dutch? because they don't call themselves that, and the Germans think that they're the Dutch. Well, in English, the word Dutch used to refer to all the Germanic language-speaking peoples of that part of mainland Europe, so excluding Scandinavia. And we called the ones living in northern Germany and the Low Countries the Low Dutch. Now we call some of them Germans, and some of them just Dutch. To Belgium now, which for a long time was considered part of the Netherlands, part of the Low Countries. Indeed, the word Belgian used to be used in English as another generic term for the people of the whole of the Netherlands, not just the bit that is now Belgium. The word Belgium comes from the Latin name for where the Belge tribe lived. It started off as an exonym, so a name that people outside of the region used rather than the people living there, which is called an endonym. But it was adopted by people living in the southern Low Countries during the region's struggle for independence from Spain in the 16th century. Yes, Spain used to run the Netherlands. The ones now calling themselves Belgians wanted to set themselves apart from their northern neighbours who didn't want to remain under Spanish control. So shall we head off to sunny Spain next then? Because this is without doubt one of the weirdest etymologies of all the country names that we're going to cover. Think of all the things you associate with Spain. No, I mean it, do it. Okay, I'm willing to bet my life the one thing that didn't spring to mind was rabbits. But that, my friend, is what Spain is named after. Spain is the land of the rabbits. Our word for Spain comes via French from the Latin, Hispania. And the Romans, in turn, took their word from the Carthaginians who were living on the Iberian Peninsula. When they arrived there, they were so surprised by the apparently remarkable number of long-eared rodents that they named the country after them. Although supposedly the name didn't literally mean Land of the Rabbits, it meant Land of the Rock Hyrax, which is a rabbit-like animal that lives in Africa and that the Carthaginians are more likely to have known before they rocked up in Hispania. Now, Spain isn't the only country named for what explorers discovered when they got there. Allow me to tell you the story of Iceland. So guess what Iceland's named after? Yeah, ice. We have an amazing source for the story of Iceland's name, a medieval book on the settlement of Iceland by the Vikings. It says a Norseman called Hrafna Floki Vilgerdason, on whom a character in Vikings is loosely based, attempted to settle on the island, but buggered up his farming and had to leave. 
However, in the meantime, he had named it Iceland after the vista of pack ice he saw before him on a mountain hike one day. Before that, though, the island had already been dubbed Snowland by past Viking visitors, all of whom appear to have missed the fact that the place is permanently on fire. I mean, call it Fireland, for goodness sake, or Lava Land. Anyway, we've been calling it Iceland in English for about a thousand years now. Now, those of us who speak English are really lucky. It can open all kinds of doors and enable us to work all over the world, can't it? Because being able to speak English is, you know, it's an in-demand skill. The astonishing pace that technology is moving at at the moment means that many of the best paid and most flexible jobs are now in the tech sector. Just ask Mr. Musk and Mr. Bezos. And now anyone can make the switch to working in tech, regardless of age and background, thanks to Triple Ten and their coding bootcamp. Their five to nine months online courses mean you can study anytime, anywhere, and combine it with your current job. And Triple Ten guarantees a full refund if you don't get a job within 180 days of graduation, something that they're clearly confident won't happen. Because Triple Ten gives its students projects at real tech companies and continues to support them even after they've graduated. So click the link in the description of this video and sign up for a completely free career consultation call with Triple Ten and use my code ROBWORDS to get 30% off on all of their programs. Just give it a go. Now, rather literal descriptions like Iceland give us the names of other countries too. Not so far away, Norway was named for the fact that if you sailed along its coast, it led you north. Really, really north. The Old English name is quite literally North Way, and there's a vestige of that Old English spelling in the way we call people from Norway, Norwegians. We should talk about their Scandinavian brothers and sisters, the Danes, next. The Den at the start of Denmark is actually a bit of a weird one. No one's certain where it came from. It's thought to maybe come from a long lost word meaning low or flat, but it might also be someone's name, that of legendary ruler, King Dan. Dan is not a good name for a king. There's no proof King Dan existed, but he pops up in myths and sagas. The mark in the name is a bit more straightforward. Mark is an old term for a borderland, similar to the word march. However, it could also mean forest. So this is either the borderland or the forest of the Danes. This idea of a borderland crops up in the stories of a few other European countries' names too. One of them is down in Austria, our word Austria comes from a Latinized version of the German language name for the country, which nowadays is Österreich, but used to be that. Both names mean Eastern realm. However, they evolved from an earlier name, Ostmark, which meant Eastern March and referred to the region's role as the Eastern borderland of the Holy Roman Empire. Poland is also named for the people who traditionally lived there, the Poles. Yes, it really is as simple as that. Past English names for the country have been Poil, Pull, and Pole. There's a Polish beer I've occasionally enjoyed called Lech, and that's actually named after the legendary founding father of Poland, Lech. He was one of three brothers who, according to folklore, founded three Slavic states. Another of the brothers was called Rus, who, according to the legend, founded the Eastern Slavic nations, including Russia, although that's not actually true. And the third brother supposedly gave his name to another European country. His name was Czech. Yes, we're in Czechia now, which until recently was known as the Czech Republic. Although the legend of Rus, Lech and Czech provides a very neat explanation for the name of Czechia, again, it isn't actually that simple. Czechia is named for the folk who used to live in Bohemia, the Roman name for the region, and they called themselves the Cheshi. Now, while we're slaving over the Slavic lands, let's kill a further two birds with one semantic stone. Slovakia and Slovenia both ultimately mean the same thing. The Slovaks and Slovenes are two groups of people whose names ultimately mean Slav, and their respective countries, which have totally distinct cultures and histories, are named after them. By the way, a few moments ago, I made a little word play with the words slave and Slav. But did you know that they are actually related? It's in a fairly roundabout way, though. Our word slave comes from the Latin sclavus, which meant slave, but that made reference to the fact that a lot of the slaves taken by the Romans were Slavs. Their word for Slav was also sclavus. Incidentally, the Romans had another word for slave, servus, and that takes us to our next destination, Serbia. 
So there's a thousand year old misconception that the word serve comes from that Latin word servus from which we get the word serf and ultimately servant. And that misconception wasn't helped by the fact that Serbian was sometimes written Servian in English, something that the people of Serbia expressly asked us to stop doing to avoid that association. Because it's a false association. We don't know why the people of the region called themselves Serbs or Serba, and we just know that their country is named after them. Serbia's neighbour and ex-Yugoslavian partner, Croatia, is also named after the people who populated the area, the Croats. We call the country Croatia, but in Croatia it's called Hrvatska, which looks like a very different word, but actually isn't. H and K noises swap around all the time between languages, and the V in Hrvatska used to be present in the English name too. We used to call Croats Krovats or Kravats. And doesn't that last word look familiar? Well, it should do, because we use the exact same word to refer to the frilly neckwear, the cravat. Yep, a cravat is literally a Croat. You see, we've taken the word cravat from French twice. Firstly, to describe the people of Dalmatia, the Croats, and secondly, to describe the necktie. In the intervening periods between those two borrowings, the French king, Louis XIII, is said to have enjoyed the stylish chest adornments of Croatian mercenaries so much that he ordered his entire court to begin wearing them, and the garment was dubbed the Croat, or the Cravat. When they caught on in England, we called them the same thing. Oh, behave. Now we're talking about France, let's stick with it, because the country is, like Croatia, Serbia, and all those others, named for the people who once lived there. France gets its name from the Franks, the Germanic tribe who settled the region during the Roman period. But for a long time, it was thought the name Frank derived from a word meaning free, like when we speak frankly, we speak freely, right? However, that's no longer what etymologists think. They think it was the other way round. Much like the Romans essentially started calling enslaved people Slavs, they appear to have adopted the name of the Frankish people to mean free. Because in Frankish Gaul, only the Franks themselves were granted full freedom. So where did the Franks get their name from then? Well, the dominant theory is that they're named after one of their favourite weapons, a javelin called something along the lines of a Francon. In Old English, it was a Franca. Let's head back north and to the Nordics, where there's another country that's just named for the people who live there. It's Sweden. The land of the Swedes. It's hard to know what else to call them, really. The Swedes call their own country Sverio, which is also just Realm of the Swedes. Past English names for Sweden have been Sweorland and Swetherland, and I like the Scots name, Swain. Here's a little fact I think you'll like. So you know how a cravat is literally a Croat? Well, Elvis's natty blue shoes were actually made of Sweden. Yes, our word suede comes from the French term gant de suède, meaning glove from Sweden. Suede just means Sweden in French. But it's ended up meaning the material that these stylish Scandinavian gloves were traditionally made of. Let's head to Sweden's alphabetical bedfellow next, Switzerland. Because, again, we're just talking about a country named after its people. Switzerland means land of the Switzer. Surprise! Although here's where it gets confusing, because Switzer is actually an old Germanic word for the people of a place called Switz. So, Switzerland actually means land of the people of the land called Switz. Ugh. And Switz is actually just one part of what ended up being Switzerland. Now, I've talked so much about countries named for peoples, but one notable group are screaming out at us from the name of another European country. Let's head to Romania. Romania is so-called because the Romans used to live there. Indeed, Romanians historically see themselves as the direct descendants of the children of Rome. Their words for Roman and Romanian are the same. There's just a slight difference in pronunciation. The etymology of this one is a bit absurd, really, because Romania is now a place named after a people, named after a place, named after a person. But what are we going to do? Revert to the old name, Dacia or Dacia, perhaps? But that's already been taken by that Romanian car company. The Romans are arguably the ultimate European tribe, but so many more of the nations that we've yet to cover are just named for the groups that have lived there. So let's just quickly run through them in a section that I'm calling the Tribal Countdown. <laughs> hey, that band's called Europe. 
Anyway, cue the rights free music. Here we go. In at number 10, it's turkey, however you want to spell it. It's named after the Turks. And so is the bird, which gets its name from the Turkish traders who brought delicious fowl to Europe. Those weren't the turkeys we eat today, though. Europeans just used the same name for the big ass birds they found in the Americas, too. And number nine, it's Latvia. Nice and easy, this one. It's named after the Baltic tribe, the Latgalians. And number eight, it's Hungary, named for the Hungari or Ungari people. But the Hungarians call themselves the Magyars. Number seven in our tribal countdown is Greece. It gets its name from the Latin for land of the Greeks. Duh. Although the Greeks were just one of many groups in the modern day country. In at six, it's Finland, the land of the Finns, although the Finns call themselves Suoma Lysit and their country Suomi. In fact, their language rarely uses the F sound in native words. At number five, we're popping just across the water to Estonia, which is named after the Est people. We used to call Estonians Ests, but it was a horror show of excessive sibilance, so we don't anymore. Number four in our tribal countdown is Bulgaria. It's named for the Bulgars who lived there, isn't it? Azerbaijan is at number three. Apparently it is in Europe, who knew? It means land of the Azer, and the locals will proudly tell you that the tribal name means either something along the lines of brave fella or fire keeper. At number two, it's Armenia. This name goes way back. The oldest reference is in Old Persian. And as far as we know, it just means where the Armenians live. And at number one, but don't read too much into it, it's Albania, which is named after the Albanoi, which was an Illyrian tribe. However, the Albanians call their country Skiperia, which means land of the comprehensible people. They define themselves by a common language. Ta-da! The observant among you will notice that those were actually just in reverse alphabetical order. The idea of ranking countries in any other way brought me out in a cold sweat. Moving on, North Macedonia is an interesting one. It only fairly recently got the North bit of its name at the end of a dispute with Greece over who got to use the word Macedonia. There's a part of Greece called that too. The word itself is thought to ultimately derive from a Greek word meaning tall or high, which has been taken as a potential reference to the region's inhabitants who were apparently sort of lanky. It might, however, simply be a reference to the mountains of Macedonia. And that brings us onto another category of country names, those that come from features of the landscape. Perhaps the most obvious one of these is Montenegro. Its name is a word for word translation of the local name into Venetian. It means Black Mountain and refers to the dark forest that covered Mount Lovchen. Next door, Bosnia and Herzegovina likely gets the first part of its name from the river Bosna. Bosna itself is thought to rather literally just mean running water. Meanwhile, the Herzegovina part means land of the Herzog, which is a kind of German duke. It's named after a 15th century noble. Like Bosnia, Moldova is named after a river too, the Moldova River, which flows through Romania. But you will never in a million years guess what the Moldova River is supposedly named after. Actually, go on, try. Try. Now, if you said a drowned dog, you are somehow, goodness knows how, correct. According to legend, the founder of the region's people, a fellow called Dragos, had a dog that drowned while chasing an ox into the river's waters. That dog's name was Mulder. Oh, here's a good one, Portugal. Portugal comes from the Roman name, Portus Calais, which was once the name for specifically Porto. It means Calais port, but that first word is actually rather mysterious. It might be from the Greek Calis, meaning beautiful, which is a rather lovely explanation. It might come from the name of the people who used to live there, or it might come from a Celtic word that means port, in which case Portugal just means port port. Okay. One of the theories behind Malta's name is that it comes from a Phoenician word simply meaning port, or maybe refuge, or rather disappointing and literal. But there is a fancier potential explanation that the Roman name for the island, Melita, actually means land of honey. A much sweeter idea. A handful of Europe's tiniest nations are also named after features of their landscape. The Vatican is named after Mons Vaticanus, the hill upon which the papal palace sits. Meanwhile, Luxembourg is a Germanic rendering of the Latin name, which meant little castle. Oh. 
Liechtenstein is also named after a castle, Liechtenstein Castle, the name of which means light or bright stone in German. While we're thinking small, San Marino is named after Saint Marinus, a Dalmatian stonemason from Dalmatia, he wasn't a dog, who set up a small church in a place called Monte Titano in what is now San Marino. Meanwhile, miniature monarchy Monaco has a puzzling name. It comes from the Greek for single house or house alone. But as for why it's called that, well, your guess is as good as anyone's. Similarly, adorable little Andorra's name is also a mystery. It possibly comes from an Arabic term meaning the forest, or it might be from the Navarese for shrub covered land. Either way, it seems to be named after a load of trees. Cyprus might sound like it's named after a tree too, but it isn't. Or maybe it is. We don't actually know what it's named after. You'll find a lot of sources saying that it's named after copper because it was the main source of the metal for the likes of the Romans. However, it seems more likely that it's the other way round. The Latin name for the metal was Cyprium Ace, which meant metal of Cyprus. So that would mean that the metal is named after the island. Therefore, we don't know where the island got its name. While we're talking about mysteries, there's one big one that needs solving, and that is where Italy got its name. It seems amazing to me that we haven't worked this one out yet. To the Greeks and Romans, Italy just referred to the lower part of, you know, the boot that is modern day Italy. But why they called it that, we don't know. It's possibly from an old term meaning land of young cattle, but it could also be named after the mythical King Italus. Unfortunately, Italy is another one for the Dunno pile. Also languishing in the bin of uncertainty is Lithuania, which has linguists stumped. Lithuanians like to joke that their country's name is linked to their word for rain, particularly when the Baltic weather turns bad. But that is just a play on words, really. The real root is unknown. And puzzled linguists also have Georgia on their minds. Now this one seems like it should be obvious, but it really isn't. There are three possible explanations for why Georgia is called Georgia. One, it's from the Greek for land of the farmers. Fair enough. Two, it's named after St. George, who was particularly revered there. Indeed, the country's flag to this day features a cross of St. George. Or three, and most kick-ass of all, Georgia comes from the old Persian for land of the wolves. Just take your pick. Okay, just two countries left, Ireland and my homeland, the United Kingdom. Well, I dedicated a whole video to where they got their names right here. And if you've already seen it, just watch this one here. Please subscribe if you've enjoyed this one. It was quite a lot of work. And sign up to my free newsletter if you like. See you in the next one.